actually unmute, sorry. Um, all right, so hi everybody again, this is Larry Eames and I'm going to kick things off. So welcome everyone to the HELP, I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian webinar series or HELP for short. This series is brought to you by the American Library Association's Government, Government Documents Roundtable. And thank you all so much for joining us. You will be muted during the webinar, but we encourage you to participate in chat. If you don't see that chat window, you can click on the chat icon, which will be along the bottom of your screen. We also encourage you to add questions via the Q&A function throughout today's session. We will be saving those towards the end, but we encourage you to submit them as you think of them. And if there are technical issues, Samantha Hagar is on hand to help. Feel free to chat with her and worst case scenario, do remember that this session is being recorded. In terms of our upcoming webinars, we will be taking January off. Uh, go to midwinter, join your colleagues. Uh, we are also soliciting suggestions and volunteers for our spring 2022 webinar season. So if you have topic ideas or would like to present, uh, go ahead and let us know. You can see more of our webinars on our YouTube channel, which is a link that I'm going to drop in the chat here. And please give us a follow if you're a YouTube user to make sure you don't ever miss, a, miss one. So let us kick it off with today's webinar. Today's webinar is Hawaii Government Information from an Internationally Recognized Independent Kingdom to an Illegally Occupied American State. And our speakers today are Gwen Sinclair and Kapena Shem. Kapena is a Hawaii specialist librarian in the Hawaiian and Pacific Collections Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library. He's also an adjunct instructor in the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library and Information Science Program. And Gwen Sinclair chairs the Government Documents and Maps Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library. She's also an adjunct instructor in the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library and Information Science Program, and the author of the open textbook, Government Information, a reference for librarians in Hawaii. Um, I am going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here and turn things over to our presenters. Mahalo. Thank you. So, aloha, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. And thank you very much for attending. Um, Kapena and I are going to introduce ourselves next. Go ahead, Kapena. All right. Aloha. My name is Kapena Shim. I'm a Hawaii Specialist Librarian at uh, UH Manoa. I currently live in Ahupua of Haleaha. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in the moku of Ko'olaloa, and I am um, on the mokupuni of Oahu. And it's good to be with you all today. Uh, we're talking about uh, Hawaiian informa or government information um, for Hawaii. And aloha everyone, I am Gwen Sinclair, the Government Documents Librarian at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library. And I live in the Ahupua of Honolulu in the Moku of Kona on the Mokupuni of Oahu. And just uh, to kind of, for those that are not familiar with Hawaiian, <clears throat> so Ahupua is like a, a division of land and then the uh, Moku is a district that the division is a part of and then the Mokupuni is, is island. All right, so today we have uh, three learning object objectives for you. Uh, the first one is to become familiar with key moments and documents produced during different periods of political history in Hawaii. The second is to gain an understanding of the most important databases, websites, libraries, and archives with holdings of Hawaii documents. And the last piece is to gain knowledge of Hawaii geography and land-related resources. So to start us off, before we get into the government information, we thought we'd give a quick geography lesson for the benefit of people who are not familiar with Hawaii. Hawaii is a chain of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and it's the southernmost state in the US, and it is located 2,400 miles from the West Coast. It has eight main islands along with 124 small islands and islets. And there are four counties that consist of islands and groups of islands. Uh, next slide, please. And just a few facts about Hawaii. The population is 1.42 million, of which 75% live on Oahu. Almost one out of five residents of Hawaii was born outside the US. 
Since their arrival in Hawaii, Caucasians have never constituted a majority of the population. Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, and other laborers were brought to work on sugar plantations, and subsequently Asians have comprised the largest minority group with Filipinos surpassing Japanese in the past few decades. Native Hawaiians and part Hawaiians are a growing percentage of the state's population. About a quarter of the population identifies as multiracial. There are two official languages in Hawaii, English and Olelo Hawaii, or the Hawaiian language. Uh, about 6% of households uh, Hawaiian is spoken at home, and 12.7% 12 12 of school-aged children speak Hawaiian at home. Uh, Ilocano, Tagalog, and Japanese are the most common non-English languages spoken at home, and other important languages are Chinese, Spanish, and Korean. And over to you, Kapena. All right, so now let's dive right into it. So we're going to start off with the Kingdom of Hawaii um, from 1795 to 1893. And a little disclaimer, so there's a lot of information, a lot of government information about Hawaii. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I want to begin with uh, the Kingdom of Hawaii when Kamehameha uh, begins to formalize the kingdom from 1795 onward. <clears throat> and here's a picture of the Hawaiian flag. Um, all right, so let's begin with uh, Kamehameha I and his efforts to unify a Hawaiian kingdom, or to se secure the unification of the Hawaiian kingdom. So in, in, in these next couple slides, I'm gonna kind of be giving you a lot of, it's gonna be history heavy, and that's because I think it's important when we're looking at government documents in Hawaii to have a sense of the political history that's unfolding and sort of the interactions that are taking place um, amongst our elite, our chiefs um, with the rest of the world. And home and in home as well. So in 1791, you have Kamehameha consolidating rule over Hawaii Island after years of civil war. And that's just Hawaii Island, not the whole island chain. Um, and then in 1794, he actually cedes the island rule to King George III on the British ship Discovery in the presence of George Vancouver. And they're recognizing themselves as British subjects. And throughout this, these, these his, historical sort of notes, I'm, I'm kind of providing references to key people and names as ways to sort of help expand our sort of understanding of perhaps maybe there are more records out there that are not essentially government records, but or government information, but they're published sources like, for instance, uh, George Vancouver's journals, right, will have information about these, these interactions and things like that. So it's like, it's like little gems that you can kind of pick up on and continue to do information research um, after this. So then in 1795, you have Kamehameha defeating uh, the Maui Kingdom, and he's now in control of Hawaii Island, Maui, Lanai, Molokai, and Oahu. And then in 1810, he gains control of Kauai and Iihau after King Kaumuali'i cedes the kingdom. And in the same year, he actually corresponds with King George III for a small vessel, flag fabric, brass guns, and a form of a register and seal, which is important because um, it, it, it allows for, for, for the means to then um, go out into the, into the ocean and, and, and trade with other nations around the world. Um, and then in 1819, he dies at the age of 83 in Kamakohonu um, in Kailua on Hawaii. And he leaves his son Liholiho the throne. And here you'll have a picture of, of the letter that, that Kamehameha signed to King George III um, in 1810. And this is actually in the Royal Archives in Windsor Castle. Um, so now we're getting, getting into Kamehameha II, Liho Liho. Um, and in this period of time, you really see a lot of work happening to sort of affirm the rule of the kingdom after his father passes away. So in 1819, he becomes king at age 21 and he's sharing power with um, his Hanai mother, Kahumanu, who is the Kuhinunui, which is sort of like the, the minister, like the prime minister in some ways, and also with the council of chiefs. And in this time, um, after, after resisting, he ends the Aikapu system um, and it wins this battle of Kuomo'o, which, which is important because it, it leads to sort of the larger Kapu system, which is a re religio-political system um, that's led by the chiefs, sort of it, it, it ending. Um, and the Aikapu, which is a restriction on eating. So men and women couldn't eat together. So by them eating together, you know, it begins to end that system and it begins to sort of end the larger system that that 
that particular kapu is a part of. So, so that, that's a major change that's happening in 1819. And then right after that, in 1820, you have the first company of missionaries arriving, ADCFM missionaries from Boston, and they're bringing with them religious teachings and a printing press, which is exciting because now we begin to see a lot of uh, broadsides and notices being published by the government utilizing this press. So in 1822, in January, you have the first printing, uh, less than one being produced. And then in March, you have the first government notice being printed and that's proclaiming laws to maintain control over disturbances by seamen. So in this time, you, you see a lot of, not only missionaries are here, but you also see a lot of traders and merchants and seamen coming to these islands and they're causing disturbances. So you see the need to have um, notices being produced to help enforce the rule of order. So then the year after that in 1823, you have uh, Liho Liho sailing to England with his wife and chiefs to, to affirm the British protection over the kingdom from King George V, I mean the fourth. Um, and in 1890, 1824, he dies. He dies in London with his wife from measles. And then the following year, when the news is received that he passes away, his younger brother, Kaui Keoli, is proclaimed king at age 11. Which is interesting because I didn't realize after um, how young he was. I mean, he was 11 years old when he is proclaimed king. Um, and the kingdom is still largely, largely controlled by Kahumanu until her death in 1832. So here you have a picture of Kahumanu, you have a picture of uh, Liho Liho. And here you actually have an image of an article called Kamo'olelo o Kamehameha from uh, Samuel M. Kamakao, who is a Hawaiian historian in the 1800s. And he wrote a series of articles talking about the history of Kamehameha. So in this time, although there isn't too much publications from the government uh, documenting the interactions of the, of, the, of the government and the chiefs, you have a lot of information being published after in the latter half of the 1800s, talking about these times of the chiefs, of the chiefs. and Kamakau and his history of Kamehameha is, is a really a foundational text in understanding this particular time. So here you'll see uh, a little sample of some, some broadsides, pamphlets, circulars, and handbills that are being produced in the 1820s and 30s. Some, some really major ones. So you have 1822, the first printed government document concerning disturbances of foreigners. You have in 1827, what some would consider the first criminal code um, that are being produced. And they're saying things like, don't kill people, don't steal, don't drink. And then in 1834, you see this pamphlet of laws which, which some people would consider the first penal code. So now we get into Kamehameha III, Kaui Keoli and his work to formalize the kingdom. And in this particular time, you see a lot of work happening to really kind of create a government structure. And you see a lot of publications being produced after the structure is created. So in 1839, you have the Hawaiian Bill of Rights enacted. He kumu kanavai, ame ke kanavai, ho'oponopono vai vai, no kohava ipai aina. So that's really important because it's, it's creating a baseline of rights. For, for Hawaiian subjects. And then you also have in that same year, Na Kui Kahi being published, which is um, all the five treaties to date that are between the US, Great Britain, and France. And France had three treaties, so that's why there's five. Um, and then in 1840, you have the first constitution enacted, which is published in 1841 as Ke Kumu Kanavai, Ame Na Kanavai, Oku Hawaii, Hawaii Pai Aino. Then in 1842, you have the Constitution and Laws today translated into English, and that's, and that's known as the translation of the Constitution and Laws of the Hawaiian Islands. And in that same year, you have uh, Kaui Keoli sending an envoy to US and Europe to secure independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And then in 1843, this is an important year, uh, we gain recognition as an independent sovereign state, uh, but this happens amongst this, this major thing that that took place called the Paulette Affair, where you have this British Admiral Paulette coming to Hawaii in February and ceding Hawaii under British rule. Then you have Admiral Thomas coming to Hawaii and saying, no, 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 we, that's, that's wrong. You're not supposed to do that. You know, we're, I'm restoring the sovereignty of the Hawaiian kingdom. And that becomes a national holiday called La Hoi Hoi Ea, right? The day of sovereignty was restored. That was on July 31st. 
And then on November 28th, um, the independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom is formally recognized by Great Britain and France in this document um, called the Anglo-Franco -Fran Proclamation. And that day is also a national holiday. And it was just celebrated a couple weeks ago, um, La Pulkoa, so November 28th um, is considered our Independence Day. And here you can see the back page of that, that uh, proclamation and it's actually in the United Kingdom National Archives. Right. So you have that happening, which is a really, really important year. And, and, and since then you have La Pulkoa and La Hoi being celebrated, celebrated. And then in 1845, you have the statute laws. Um, being published, and these are reorganizing the executive and ju judicial branches. But in that same year, you also have the Land Commission being created, and that's being created to handle different land claims of foreigners and natives. Because throughout the, the 30s and the 40s, you have uh, foreigners in particular sort of, you know, making claims to land. So, so the kingdom needed to create this, this commission to start to, to handle these requests. For these claims. And then in 1848, you have the Mahele division begins, and that leads to the eventual creation of a land base for the king, the chiefs, and the government, and the eventual privatization of land. So now let's get into kind of how the government structure gets formally defined through the 1840 constitution, which is super interesting. And it's interesting because if you think about the structure, think about sort of the information that's going to be produced out of the structure. Right, all of these different um, branches of government now be are now formed, and they're now going to be producing records and publications. So you have the prerogatives of the king being defined. You have the duties of the prime minister being defined, or the kuhina nui. Uh, you have the duties and powers of the island governors being defined, and there is island governors for the four main groupings of islands: so Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. And it's interesting because. The governors actually had a lot of power um, and there is a lot of power being delegated to them with the, the people that are living on those islands. Um, you have the House of Nobles being defined, um, their role in membership. You have the representative, representative body being established and you have the legislative branch being uh, defined and that's comprising of the House of Nobles and the representative body. Then you have tax officers being appointed. Uh, you have the judicial branch, in particular island judges and Supreme Court judges being defined. And here you can see a, an image of the 1840 constitution in Hawaiian, and you also see the 1842 translation right over here. All right, so that's sort of the initial structure that's being defined from the 1840 constitution. And then the statutes of 1845 further defines the structure. And it does so through the through its work to organize the executive branch in particular. So the first act of that statute laws of 1845 is to organize the executive ministry of the Hawaiian Islands. So it's, it's defining the roles and the responsibilities of the king and his appointed ministers to carry out his executive duties. So you have the Minister of Interior, uh, Interior Affairs created, and that's primarily being cared for by the premier or the Kuhina Nui. You have the Minister of Foreign Relations, Minister of Finance, Minister of Public Instruction, and Attorney General. Um, then you have the island governors and their roles being defined further. Um, and then the king and the ministers, they begin to form the Privy Council. And in this Privy Council, you have the island governors as honorary members. And even in the statute laws, it says minutes are to be kept. So now we know that there's minutes being kept of, of this Privy Council. And here's an image of the statute laws of 1845. And um, in these two documents, 1840 constitution or 1842 translation of the constitution and then the 1845 statute laws, government printing is also being defined, which is super cool too. So in 1842 in chapter one, it begins off by saying, hereafter no law of the kingdom shall take effect without first being printed and made public. And it also says in chapter one, Copies of the law shall be delivered to nobles, representative body, judges, tax officers, police officers, and Hawaiian newspapers and councils of foreign countries. And that's really interesting because it gives you a sense of sort of the, the reach, the circulation of these documents. And then in 1845, the statute laws are establishing the, the government press. So you have the director who is the ex officio editor of the newspaper, The Polynesian, which is considered the first um, official organ of the Hawaiian government. Um, and you have 
this director responsible for executors, official circulars and notices, and newspaper insertions um, as required by law, and then transmitting these uh, this organ to different uh, branches of government. But I bolded newspaper insertions because throughout Hawaii's history, there's many, many newspapers that started from 1834 onward. Um, and you'll find quite a bit of newspaper notices or a lot of government notices in newspapers um, in many of the newspapers that we have. And here we have also Kahai Hawaii, which is in 1856, that becomes the official paper of the kingdom. And throughout the latter half of the 1800s, you'll see other official papers of the kingdom being produced as well. All right, and then here, here's a little uh, image, a bunch of images of different minister reports. So one of the, the great sources of information that I love to direct people to is these minister reports that we have in the Hawaiian collection. And these are published either annually or biannually, um, and they're published in Hawaiian and they're published in English. We have things from like the Minister of Interior, the Minister of Finance, and even the Board of Education. And it's a great way to sort of zoom into a particular set of years of the Hawaiian Kingdom to see sort of what was happening within these different ministry offices. Um, so another major body of materials that's being produced post 1845 is legal materials, right? So we have these compilation of laws that are being produced. You have the statute laws of 1846 that we just saw. We have the penal codes, 1850, 1869, the civil code, 1859, and compiled laws of 1884. You also have a lot of session laws being produced, and that's either annually or biannually when, uh, when the legislative assembly sort of ends their sessions. Um, and that's always published under the authority of the reigning monarch. So you have like the laws of Koi Keoli or the laws of Alexander Liholiho and so forth. You know. But there'll be like the laws of Kamehameha III or the laws of Kamehameha IV. Uh, and then related to that, you also have journals that are being produced from these legislative assemblies. So initially you have a journal for the House of Nobles and a journal for the House of Representatives. But then eventually it combines into the journals of the legislative assembly. And then lastly, you have case law. So you have reports from um, the different courts uh, of judgments and decisions, um, including the Supreme Court. And you'll see that these case law reports cover all aspects of, of law that's being decided in the courts. And here's just some, some examples of the penal codes and the civil code, and then also of the laws that are enacted under the different uh, reigning monarchs. And these are also published um, in Hawaiian and English as well. Now let's get into constitutions. Uh, so we have many constitutions actually um, throughout our, our history. So we have two constitutions under Kamehameha III, the 1840 Constitution, 1850 Constitution. You have the 1864 Constitution under Kamehameha V. You have the Bayonet Constitution under King Kalakaua in 1887. And that's known as the Bayonet Constitution because it was forced upon him. And then you have the draft Constitution of 1893 um, that Queen Lulu Kalani tried to promulgate. Um, and that eventually led to her overthrow where this Committee of Safety uh, of American businessmen, uh, sugar, um, who had you know uh, roots as uh, descendants of missionaries, conspire with U.S. Minister Stevens to end the monarchy and form a provisional government um, until the U.S. annex Hawaii. So this minister, Steve, Minister Stevens, or, um, orders U.S. Boston Marines to land on shore uh, to add pressure to sort of force the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And here's an image of that draft constitution and then of uh, Queen Lilio Kalani. So that leads us into the provisional government. And here is an image just to sort of visually sort of kind of add, add weight to that, to that moment in time is, is a picture of those, those Marines um, on shore. So the provisional government, you know, they've only were around for about a year, but they're actively producing things as well. So they have the first thing they do is they produce the Committee of Safety Proclamation, which abrogates the monarchy and announces control and management of public affairs until Hawaii is part of the United States. And it also establishes the executive council that's going to run things. So you have Dole, King, Jones, and Smith. You have them producing leg uh, legal materials, so executive council acts, orders and announcements, laws and statutes, and administrative rules and procedures. 
And you also see that they're continuing to produce these those reports from many of the um, different departments of the government that are carryovers from the Hawaiian Kingdom. And here I wanted to kind of highlight this this handbill here um, to kind of show resistance to all of this. So you have this handbill in 1893 from the Ladies Hawaiian Patriotic and Independent League who are, are assembling and, and they form the constitution for their assembly that's to sort of secure the independence of the Hawaiian kingdom. So you see immediately after this happening of the provisional government, uh, you have a lot of resistance happening, not only from the elite, the chiefs, but also from the people to sort of uh, secure the independence of the Hawaiian kingdom. So now we get into the Republic of Hawaii. And this image right over here is also a real heavy image. It's Queen Liliuokalani being taken up the steps of Iolani Palace, her palace um, on the back side. So if you ever visit Hawaii on, on the back end of Iolani Palace to, to be placed under house arrest uh, for conspiracy that she was part of this 1895 rebellion to end the Republic of Hawaii um, and to restore her as sovereign. So she's walking up her steps to be under house arrest, essentially. So the Republic of Hawaii is also producing quite a bit of materials too. They have their constitution um, and that's published in English and Hawaiian. You also have a lot of drafts that are around and you also have proceedings of their constitutional convention. You have reports. So they're continue, continuing producing those reports that are from the executive, judicial and legislative branches. Uh, you have legal materials being produced. You have broadsides, especially after that 1895 uh, rebellion called Kawaku Loko, but it's also known as the Wilcox Rebellion of 1895 to end, to overthrow essentially the Republic of Hawaii and restore the queen as sovereign. And then you also have some treaties. So you have the treaty and conventions between Hawaii and Japan. And you also have the Republic of Hawaii uh, creating a treaty of annexation of Hawaii um, in 1897, which actually fails in the US Congress. And here's a picture of um, the Hawaiian version of the Republic of Hawaii's constitution. Uh, oh gosh, it's froze, did it freeze on me? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk really quickly about the Kuei petitions, because this is a really important moment in, in Hawaiian history that sort of leads to our understanding of Hawaii's political state as a, as, as, as a, as a nation. Um, so in 1897, you have President William McKinley and three rep representatives from the Republic of Hawaii signed the Treaty of Annexation, and it's submitted to the US Senate for ratification. Um, hearing this, um, Hawaiian, groups, the Hui Aloha Aina and Hui Kalai Aina and the Queen um, form a coalition. And those two Hui start a petition drive to protest the annexation treaty. And in, in a matter of about 22 days, you know, the Hui Aloha Aina collects 21,000 signatures, a little bit over 21,000 signatures across the islands protesting annexation. And the Hui Kalai Aina collects 17 signatures calling for the end of, or I mean, calling for the monarchy to be restored. So that coalition selects delegates and those delegates arrive in Washington DC to meet with the queen um, or, or to present the petitions and they meet with the queen to strategize sort of how best to present these petitions. Uh, they decide that only the Hui Aloha Aina petitions will be presented um, and, that's, and that then becomes submitted to the, 20, uh, to the second session of the 55th Congress. Interesting note about this is that the petitions from the Hui Kalai Aina, the 17,000 signatures have never been found. So if any of you represent um, different government record collections, uh, you know, if you come across these petitions, uh, definitely sort of ring bells because um, that's, that's really important. Because um, the Hui Aloha Aina petitions are actually found in the record of the 55th Congress. So that's how we, we found it. So in February, eight, uh, 1898, after weeks of meeting with different senators, um, to sway votes, the delegation leaves with only 46 votes in favor of annexation, which is important because it was down from 58 and you need 60 votes to, rat to ratify a treaty, two thirds of, of the votes. And, and essentially what happens is they don't have the, the, uh, enough votes, so it doesn't pass or it fails in Congress. 
And then what happens though, in, in July of 1898, with the pressures of the Spanish-American War that just happened as well during this time, you have the US Senate passing a joint resolution annexing Hawaii. Um, and this is important to note because a joint resolution essentially is, is just has jurisdiction amongst or between the borders of the United States. Um, and this is known as a Newsland, New Lands Resolution. Um, and what happens is President McKinley, he then signs this resolution or statute into law on the 7th and um, this joint resolution is passed. And this joint resolution is being, you know, is then used in August to annex Hawaii as an American uh, territory. And here, here are pictures of um, the Kuei petitions and actually, these are images of my great, great, great grandparents signing the petition. So Alania Wilcox and uh, Edward Wilcox, uh, their signatures are right over there. So now let's talk about uh, reference works and bibliography. So if you wanted to kind of dive into information pertaining to the government during this time, I highly recommend uh, David Forbes Hawaiian National Bibliography. There's four volumes of it. Um, he does a great job at sort of uh, documenting the many publications um, regarding the Hawaiian kingdom uh, from 1780 to 1900. Yeah, Fundamental Law of Hawaii being um, edited and indexed by Lauren Thurston. And he, he kind of compiles some, some, some key sort of legal documents. You have Helen Shapin's Guide to Newspapers of Hawaii. Um, and she does a really good job at sort of pointing you to all the different newspapers published in Hawaii. You have Historical Statistics of Hawaii by Robert Schmidt. And this is a really cool source because he gives you statistics, but he also gives you the sources of where those statistics are coming from. And you'll notice that a lot of them are coming from government documents. Then the law school has a bunch of, of uh, library guides that you can utilize for, um, for Hawaiian law and finding legal history of Hawaii. Um, some key databases. So you have Puna Viola, which is a great collection of legal, legal materials. Uh, you have Hockey Trust, which is also a really great collection of digitized materials from various academic libraries. And those academic libraries tend to have a lot of Hawaiian government documents. You have LLMC, which is an, another collection of legal documents. Um, and in all of these three, um, well, this one is completely open. You can easily access it and it's completely free. This one, a lot of the government documents, they're in public domain, so you can easily access it. And LLMC, they actually have a, an open access portal that, that you can access some documents there. Papakilo, so Papakilo is a database that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has created, and it provides um, access to a lot of Hawaiian language newspapers, Mahele records, and um, uh, the Forbes bibliography, and much more. Chronicling America has a bunch of Hawaiian, um, or has a bunch of English language newspapers, and the Hawaiian Mission Houses has a lot of records from the Protestant American missionaries, which includes many journals and letters, so here's an example of Puna Viola. So here's an example of Pop Kilo, and you can see some really key collections here. Now, as you could have wrap this up, uh, uh, also be mindful of the National Archive records. So we have the domestic records from the state archives, and you have some really great digital collections of theirs. You also have international records from uh, different national archives. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of the breadth of that, here's a, an, an image of the different treaties and postal conventions that the Hawaiian Kingdom had with different countries around the world. And all of these places will have records from the Hawaiian Kingdom. So that's about it for the Hawaiian Kingdom. And I'm going to turn it over to, to Gwen. Mahalo, Kapena. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? OK. so. Um, as Kapena mentioned, Hawaii was annexed in 1898. In 1900, the Hawaiian Organic Act was uh, established and it uh, served the function of a constitution. It established the structure of government in the territory and it was published in English and Hawaiian. On the slide, you can see the Hawaiian language version of the Hawaiian Organic Act. Um, next slide, please. Um, an important bibliography for territorial documents is official publications of the territory of Hawaii. It lists the titles of publications issued by each agency between 1900 and 1959, and it's also available in the LLMC digital database that Kapena mentioned. 
And on the slide, you can see uh, an image of the title page. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of territorial publications and records, the Hawaii State Archives holds most of them. It was established in 1905 as the Territorial Archives. It has recently digitized many of its finding aids and its subject and name index cards. The slide shows an example of an index card entry for a letter concerning an attorney general opinion related to Prince Jonokuhio Kalaniana'ole, who served as Hawaii's delegate in Congress from 1903 to 1922. The index cards cover not only the archives collections, but also local newspapers and periodicals. The archives digital collections also include photographs like this one of a Korean boy and his mother. Next slide, please. Hawaii was under martial law from the beginning of World War II until 1944, although civil government was restored in 1943. The main repository for documents related to the military government are at the National Archives in the records of the U.S. Army Forces of the Middle Pacific. The Hawaii War Records Depository, which is part of the uh, Archives and Manuscripts Department here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library, was established during the war to collect both government and non-government primary and secondary source material about Hawaii during the war and some of the finding aids are available online. The War Research Laboratory at the University of Hawaii at Manoa conducted research on the social aspects of war, such as race relations and labor shortages. On the slide is an excerpt from a publication that documented incidents of discrimination against African-American troops that were observed by local residents. The papers of the two governors who were in office during World War II Poindexter and Stainback include a number of documents related to the war effort and the military government activities. For example, copies of the War Department general and special orders can be found in these papers. Next slide, please. Major statehood efforts were undertaken in the 1930s and in the 1950s. As a result, uh, many hearings were held by various congressional committees. In addition, the Hawaii Equal Rights Commission and the Hawaii Statehood Commission published monographs making the case for the patriotism and loyalty of the mostly non-white population of the territory. That was the one of the biggest issues in statehood was the fact that most of the people who lived here were not white. The papers of Hawaii's delegates in Congress also contain documents related to statehood. There are several collections related to Hawaii and Hathi Trust including one about Hawaii statehood. The Statehood Act was finally passed in Congress in April of 1859, and Hawaii joined the Union as the 50th state on August 21st, 1959. Next slide. So now we will move on into the state of Hawaii, which uh, continued some of the functions of the territorial government, but of course, uh, there were some new things that came along as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, talking about the executive branch, the governor's papers are housed in the state archives and the uh, finding aids for those papers are available online, but not the contents of the papers themselves. Uh, the, the contents include correspondence, reports, and executive orders and proclamations. Current executive orders are on the governor's website, like the one shown on the slide uh, about COVID restrictions at bars and restaurants and the current attorney general opinions are available on the attorney general's website. The Legislative Reference Bureau and the Supreme Court Law Library hold copies of older AG opinions and they are also available in the LLMC digital database. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of administrative law, Hawaii administrative rules is the source. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor's Office maintains a web page with links to the administrative rules of each agency. Final and proposed rules are propo posted on each agency's website. Superseded rules are available at the Supreme Court Law Library. The slide shows a request for comments on uh, the Division of Aquatic Resources rules on reef fishing. Next slide, please. County ordinance, current county ordinances can be found on each county clerk's website. 
superseded ordinances are maintained by the Supreme Court Law Library. The slide shows an excerpt from Honolulu ordinances concerning animals. Next slide. Here are some important reference works about Hawaii. Guide to Government in Hawaii is similar to the United States Government Manual. It lists all of the government agencies in the state and counties, and it lists the federal government offices too. The State of Hawaii Data Book is the annual statistical compendium, which is compiled by the State Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs prepares the Native Hawaiian Data Book, shown on the slide, which contains statistics about Kanaka Maoli, both in Hawaii and in the entire United States. And I should put in an aside here that in Hawaii, when you use the word Hawaiian to refer to a person, that is just referring to a, a person who is a descendant of the original Polynesian um, settlers of Hawaii. It is not, um, I am not Hawaiian, I am a Hawaii resident. Um, there is no overall set of research guides for Hawaii state government information. The Hawaiian collection librarians at, at UHM, Kapena and his colleagues, have created guides to frequently requested materials such as censuses, genealogical information, and land tenure that include kingdom, provisional, territory, and state government resources. Um, as Kapena mentioned, newspapers are a valuable source of information for state government. So the UHM Guide to Hawaii Newspapers provides access to a number of resources. Major Hawaii newspapers are available in newspapers.com, which allows for searching by keyword. Uh, the library guide provides access to the text and indexes for current and historical newspapers. And the UHM Library also holds the Newspaper Clippings Morgue on microfiche, which is a valuable source of newspaper articles arranged by subject or the person or organization's name. Next slide. So important resources related to the environment. Uh, the, the main agencies dealing with the environment are the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Department of Health. The LNR manages anything to do with public lands, state parks, historic preservation, and marine and coastal resources. In many states, land transactions are handled by the county clerk, but in Hawaii, the State Bureau of Conveyances recorded land, records land transactions. Its records are online from 1992 to the present, and older records are currently being digitized. The Environmental Review Program maintains an online library of environmental impact statements and environmental assessments and publishes the environmental notice sort of like a federal register for environmental notices. Next slide. <clears throat> the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs handles business registrations and consumer complaints. These functions are sometimes handled by the Secretary of State in other states. The Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism maintains the economic statistics of the state and issues economic forecasts. It also publishes statistics on the visitor industry, which is the most important industry in the state. The State Department of Agriculture works with the Nat National Agricultural Statistical Service to compile statistics about the state's agricultural production, farms, and farm operators. Hawaii has both plant and animal quarantine branches. The cooperative extension units in the various counties produce information about crops and pests, such as the coconut rhinoceros beetle, which you see depicted on the slide. The University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization at the University of Hawaii at Manoa issues economic forecasts and reports on the visitor industry and housing. Like many places, affordable housing is a critical concern in Hawaii with the median house price on Oahu at about 1 million. Next slide. The State Department of Health maintains vital statistics for the entire state. It hosts the Hawaii Health Data Warehouse with statistics on disease outbreaks and other data. And it also publishes the results of health surveys such as the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. The State Data Center publishes its own census tabulations for the state, counties, legislative districts, census-designated places, and census tracts.
For the 2020 census, they produced informational pamphlets in 12 languages as shown on the slide. The Department of Education publishes the DOE data book listing enrollment, student achievement, and demographic data. And the Department of Human Services produces data books covering topics such as homeless services, foster care, and financial assistance to the needy. Next slide, please. The State Department of Public Safety manages the correctional system. In Hawaii, we do not have elected sheriffs in each county. Sheriffs are civil service employees who serve warrants, transport prisoners, and provide security for state facilities such as airports. DPS annual reports list prison populations in Hawaii and Arizona. Yes, we ship some of our prisoners to Arizona and monthly intakes by ethnicity. Each county's poli police department maintains crime statistics on its website. For example, Honolulu posts arrest reports and maintains an interactive crime map. Next slide. I'll briefly mention a few government entities that are unique to Hawaii. First, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is a semi-autonomous state agency established in 1978, and it's governed by an elected board of trustees. OHA receives funds for the use of ceded lands that were taken by the government following the annexation. It uses these funds to improve the well being of Native Hawaiians. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands traces its roots to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920. It designated lands for long term leases by individuals with at least 50% Hawaiian blood. Today, the department manages leases on its land for residential, commercial, and agricultural uses. A number of Hawaiian language immersion charter schools have arisen in the past few decades. Many public schools also offer Hawaiian language immersion programs. Partly as a result of this increased availability, more and more people in Hawaii speak Olelo Hawaii as a first language. The slide shows the Kaha'olawe Island Reserve Commission website. Kirk was established to administer the island of Kaho'olawe, which was used as a bombing range by the Navy until 1990. It served as a focal point for the Hawaiian sovereignty movement beginning in the 1970s. Next slide, please. The photo on the slide shows Ali'i Olani Hale, fronted by a statue of Kamehameha I. It houses the Supreme Court, the Intermediate Court of Appeal, Appeals, the Supreme Court Law Library, and the Judiciary History Center. Appellate court opinions and orders are published on the court's websites from 1998 to the present, and older ones are available from West and LLMC Digital, in Hathi Trust, or in print at law libraries. In Hawaii, judges are appointed, not elected, and they must retire at age 70. Next slide. This slide enumerates the various lower courts in Hawaii. Um, I'm not, I'm, to save time, I'm not going to go into detail about what all of them cover, but I'll just say that the slide shows uh, some of examples of what is covered in the environmental courts, like um, bad practices in fishing. Um, and there are two databases that have court records. One of them is Ho'ohiki, which has civil cases in family court, and E-Court Kokua, which covers all of the other cases. Next slide, please. The state legislature meets annually for a 60-day session. The current session laws and Hawaii revised statutes are on the legislature website, which is depicted on the slide. And previous editions of Hawaii revised statutes are available in libraries and at LLMC Digital. A new resource for Hawaii legal research is a just published book, Hawaii Legal Research, written by librarians at the William S. Richardson School of Law Library. And the librarians have also created excellent lib guides, which Kapena already mentioned. Uh, and the Supreme Court Law Library also maintains guides to legal research. Next slide. To research legislative history, the House and Senate journals are equivalent to a combination of the US congressional serial set and the congressional record in that they contain both standing committee reports and floor debate. They also contain records of who voted. Unfortunately, they are only available in print or online through LLMC or Hathi Trust. 
testimony is available online from 2007 to the present. Olelo, the public access channel for Oahu, records floor sessions and some committee hearings, as well as Honolulu City Council proceedings. The other islands also have public access channels that uh, record and broadcast county council meetings. Uh, next slide. The depository system for state documents is called HIDOC. It's operated by the State Library, which microfilms documents and distributes them to the regional public libraries in the public library system. Uh, it also prepares lists of the documents, and you see an example of one of these lists on the slide. Um, unfortunately, there is currently no web archiving system for online Hawaii state documents, but the state archives is in the process of developing a system. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm going to spend just a few minutes briefly highlighting some geospatial resources. Next slide. The Hawaii Territory Survey maps, like this 1903 map of the island of Hawaii that you see on the slide, are important sources of historical information about the islands. They can be found on the State Survey Office website and our library's uh, EVALS repository. Uh, the collection includes maps created by the Hawaiian Government Survey, which was uh, in the kingdom, the predecessor of the Territory Survey. And David Rumsey and Library of Congress are other sources of historical maps. Next slide. The Kapuka database maintained by the State Office of Hawaiian Affairs links historical data to geographic locations and allows searching by a variety of geographies. For example, one can search using the traditional land divisions of Hawaii, which are Moku, Mokupuni, Ahupua'a, or Ili. One can also search using modern land divisions like tax map keys. The site also provides access to records from the Great Mahele Land Division that took place in the mid 19th century that Kapena mentioned. The slide shows the Moku or district of Kona on the island of Hawaii, and below it is the division is the Ahupua'a of Hanapepe, a traditional land division that follows a watershed from the mountains to the ocean. Next slide. When it comes to census data, Hawaii has several idiosyncrasies. First, there are no incorporated cities or towns in the state, so we must use other census geographies like metropolitan and micropolitan areas or census designated places. We don't have independent school districts. There's just one statewide school district. Hawaiian homelands are a land division that exists in no other state. Finally, islands are not a census geography, so to find data for an island like Molokai that is part of Maui County, you must use the county divisions that comprise the island as is shown on the slide. Next slide. The Hawaii State GIS pro por program portal allows users to uh, view and download GIS data. Uh, you can search the data catalog by keyword to find data sets on topics such as body surfing sites, historical pineapple land, endangered species, political boundaries, and so forth. And there is also a Honolulu Open Geospatial Data Portal, which functions similarly but contains other types of data. And the other counties also have GIS portals. So I'm going to close now so that we have at least a little bit of time for questions. But mahalo, everyone. Thank you both so much for that just wealth of information. That was uh, incredible. And I know I, I personally learned a lot. Um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of let, let questions come in. We don't have any quite yet, um, but I, I kind of wanna start things with a question of my own. That is, what are some resources that you find yourself directing pe people to most often? So you know, your go-tos in, in that wide collection of, of resources that you just introduced us to? For me, because we got a lot of genealogy and uh, land tenure uh, research questions, I tend to uh, direct them to uh, our research guides on genealogy and land tenure. Um, but we also have a lot of interest in um, understanding sort of government um, documents within the state archives. So I often mm -hmm. refer people to the digital collections at the state archives, especially the finding aids. And then Forbes, Forbes bibliography, um, so people can see the stuff around the world. Um, yeah, right on. Yeah, I also refer people to the state archives a lot, as well as to the state library, which is the official repository of state documents. Um, and, and our library has a lot of state documents too, but we don't have 
a comprehensive collection. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, and sort of as, as we're maybe waiting for some stuff to come in, I sort of going all the way back to the beginning of today, thinking about those minister reports, like clearly a good chunk of those have been uh, archived, but or not archived, uh, made available on the web. But, you know, percentage wise, how available are those to people who maybe aren't on physically on Hawaii? Well, actually, surprisingly, you know, those minister reports, a lot of them aren't available online. Mm. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's actually one of my projects is to sort of oh, awesome. um, get a sense of, of, of sort of the Hawaiian and English and then, you know, eventually get them online. I mean, there are some available online and I think through LLMC, uh, but, but, not, but not all of them. Awesome. Yeah, I, I saw a question in the chat about yeah, military documents. Uh, the, the person was asking, because we're having a, a big issue here with the yeah. Navy regarding some leaking uh, fuel tanks uh, that are threatening the water supply. So uh, for military documents, the ones that are publicly available, um, our library gets a lot of them. Uh, documents that are issued for public comment uh, are, are usually deposited with our library in the Hawaiian collection. Uh, especially by the Navy, but also the other branches of the military. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the State Library is the official repository for a lot of those. Uh, and then the, the uh, State Environmental uh, Review Program also has receives many of those and publishes them online. But in my experience, a lot of military documents are not published online, and uh, you actually have to put in a request for them. Uh, you know, the, the military will often use um, national defense as a reason not to publish things. So sometimes it can be difficult to get documents from them. Yeah, thank you for that. And we also had a question come in on the Q&A, which is maybe going to be our last question here for time um, from Jennifer. I might have overlooked it during the legislative section, but what is a good place to track bills and voting within the Hawaii State Legisla Legislature? Well, the legislature website is the best place to track bills. Um, you know, you can search by bill number or keyword on that website and then see where a bill is uh, in the, the legislative process. Voting records are a little bit more difficult to find. Um, you can find the committee voting records in the House and Senate journal. Um, but sometimes the, the way they report voting is a little bit obtuse, in my opinion. So it's it might be not be as easy to find as say congress.gov. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'll just oh I'll scoot one last question in. So Claire's question. Um, interesting. The kingdom published its own newspaper. When did government newspapers stop, and was there a reason why publication stopped? Yeah, I'm I'm not too sure. Um, you know exactly when it stopped. I mean I mean you, you can see particular sort of. Um, end dates of particular government papers, uh, newspapers, but the reasons why that I, I haven't I haven't done that research, I'm not too sure. Thanks, exactly. fair, right on. Well, thank you both so, so much for this. I'm gonna drop another kind of set of links in the chat. Those are gonna be the link to join our mailing list so you can stay up to date on future help webinars, uh, link to our webpage and to our YouTube where you can see past webinars. Um, and again, thank you both so, so much for this. Um, I know I learned a lot. We're getting a lot of thank you, uh, thank you messages in the chat as well. And to all of the attendees, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you in February uh, for our next webinar. Okay, mahalo everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, mahalo Nui, take care.